Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you guys with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Happy Sunday, everybody. This is a special episode looking at several major economic developments from this week, as well as major concerns from economists and analysts about the health of China's economy and financial. System. I wanted to cover this in yesterday's video, but yesterday we had to look at this emerging crisis with home buyers boycotting mortgages. So this is a special episode being released today. My apologies for interrupting your Sunday morning. Let's begin by further examining Friday's economic data. We remember that China's economy officially grew 0.4% year on year in Q2, the weakest quarterly expansion since Wuhan was shut down in early 2020, and a substantial drop from the 4.8% official growth that we saw in Q1. The second quarter slump in GDP means growth will need to accelerate to over 7% in the second half of this year to deliver an annual growth of 5% for the whole year. The government's official target is 5.5%. Quote, But this will be impossible without a significant escalation of policy stimulus from the current level. End quote. And on whether this is possible or not, analysts are divided. While Beijing plans to further step up stimulus in the second half, we need to appropriately access the policy impact of such stimulus, as the zero COVID policy will be largely maintained. The government funding gap is enormous, and Beijing has yet to come up with a real solution for China's crumbling property sector, which contributes one quarter of China's economy. End quote. As we discussed on Friday, the low growth rate was the result of the Shanghai and other lockdowns, the general global environment, and an ongoing housing crisis, among other reasons. GDP growth would have contracted in the second quarter too, if not for very expensive public stimulus and support. See Friday's video for a greater examination of these points. For now, though, let's look behind the headline numbers at some of the other important indicators. And these indicators in June were very much mixed. Value-added industrial production grew 3.9% year-on-year, not a bad performance, and retail sales also saw its first increase in four months. However, youth unemployment, which we have been following closely this year, climbed to a record high. While the urban unemployment rate stabilized to 5.5% in June, coming down from 5.9% in the previous month, youth unemployment jumped to 19.3% from 18.4%, the highest since data was being collected and published publicly in January 2018. Some analysts suspect that the real rate could be even higher. Of course, we are not surprised to learn that the slump in property development deepened in June, with real estate development investment falling 5.4% year on year. This is all despite government efforts to ease restrictions imposed two years ago to force deleveraging. Output in the real estate industry, a key economic contributor, contracted 7% in the second quarter year on year, according to a special report published by the National Bureau of Statistics yesterday on Saturday. In yesterday's video too, we did a deep dive into the newest crisis for regulators and the housing sector. This is home buyers refusing to make mortgage payments en masse due to delays in pre-purchased apartments, sparking fears of contagion spreading to the Chinese banking system. Like I said, we discussed this in detail in yesterday's video. In a perverse cycle, falling sales means developers are getting less cash to ease their financial burden, which could result in more construction delays. Hey guys, if you're appreciating the video, you're getting some value from it. Don't forget to hit the like button. And for anyone who wants to go the extra mile and help keep China Update sustainable and subscribers supported, Patreon and Buy Me a Coffee links are in the description below. As always, thank you so much, everybody, for the ongoing support, and I hope you're enjoying this special Sunday episode. So this is the economic performance at the national level in Q2. When we look at Shanghai specifically, the economic damage of the two months lockdown comes much sharper in focus. Shanghai's economy shrank almost 14% officially in Q2, with many factories closed, a highly disrupted international port, and a collapse in consumer spending as the vast majority of residents sat in their apartments. Shanghai's official urban unemployment rate jumped to 12.5% in the second quarter, the only provincial level area in China where a jobless level was above 10%, and more than double the official 5.8% national Q2 rate. The 5.5% rate mentioned above was for the month of June. Shanghai's June unemployment figure stabilized to 7%, but this is still quite high. 
And as before, some analysts believe the real rate may be higher. We remember that Beijing also saw some smaller scale lockdowns and restrictions in Q2. The capital saw economic output fall like Shanghai, but the damage was less severe, seeing a 2.9% contraction in the quarter year on year. Now, while we're on the economy, let's briefly move to energy policy before we discuss debt. Several outlets are reporting that China researchers have submitted a plan to senior leaders in Beijing to start importing Australian coal again. We remember that China unofficially banned Australian coal back in 2020 after Canberra called for an inquiry into the origins of the coronavirus. This diplomatic and energy policy 180 turn is reportedly driven by fears European-led curbs on Russian energy will increase competition for coal from China's main suppliers, places like Indonesia. So far, Beijing has not officially confirmed that this policy reversal is under consideration. Now, let's finish this special episode on the Chinese economy by discussing debt and particularly how it relates to financial sector vulnerability. One week ago today, depositors in Zhengzhou, Henan province, protesting the freezing of their savings, were set upon by thugs in white t-shirts. The disturbing videos sparked dozens of different types of debates among analysts and others. One of these debates was on the health of the financial system, both for local governments as well as state-owned banks. The government at least is saying everything is okay. On Wednesday, China's central bank issued an assurance that despite a recent scandal of local lenders in Henan province freezing withdrawals, 93% of the more than 4,000 financial institutions it reviewed late last year were rated as safe as were virtually all of their assets. The head of the Financial Stability Bureau of the People's Bank of China concluded by telling reporters that, quote, risks in the country are generally controllable, end quote. Some analysts remain unconvinced. The fact that Henan tried to suppress protests rather than bail out depositors may reflect their terrible financial position. With revenues having collapsed as expenditures have risen, many local governments simply cannot take on yet another burden. And then there is this observation from a well-respected US-based political scientist in a piece published yesterday in Japanese financial media outlet Nikkei Asia called China's debt bomb looks ready to explode. How local authorities handle the fallout is shocking, even to the most jaded observers of China's political scene. Instead of compensating the depositors, who are entitled to up to 500,000 yuan according to government regulations, officials in Henan have done everything imaginable to silence them. Perhaps because Beijing seems to be able to defy financial gravity, fewer people these days worry that its ballooning debt could unleash a systemic crisis, but there are many warning signs indicating that China may face a debt reckoning soon. It might be possible for China to dodge another financial meltdown this time, but if local officials have to hire thugs to attack bank customers trying to get their money back, Investors should brace for far worse days ahead for China's banking sector. End quote. Okay, that is today's special Sunday episode looking at the economy. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. I'll see you tomorrow.